That's one of the reasons I think this passage is one of the best passages in all the Bible. Even though Kirk smirked when I said, right? Did you catch it when I said the gospel of our Lord, right? Because it's really not good news, but it is good news. And even I take pride and and joy in the fact that God knows the numbers of hairs on the top of my head. I cut them every morning, so I know that they're there. So, but is this good news? And, And Kurt said to me as we were sitting over here, right? And we were, he read Jeremiah. Did Jeremiah sound like good news? And then we were reading through the psalm. And right before he got up to walk over here to read Romans for us, he said, good news. Or something to that effect, right? And the gospel isn't really good. What's good in there? One of the readings, the only reading really this morning, but we'll, we'll twist this around here in a minute. One of the only readings this morning upon face value that has good news is Romans. And even Romans talks about the fact that the life that we had is now gone. It's something completely new because in Christ we died and in Christ we are risen. And because of that, we have new lives. So everything that was gone before is gone. And everything that is before us is something that is new. But my question for you this morning before we get into any of all of that is why are you here? Why are you here? I know some of you are here to see me kiss the cow. I know I got that and that's all good. But that that aside, why are you here? There you go. I like that. This is family. Okay. And you want to be surrounded by family. Why else? Why are others here? Why do you come here on Sunday morning? To worship God? To worship God? Why, why do you come to worship though? To refresh my faith. To refresh your faith. What is worship really about? Is it about us? Don't answer that. That's a rhetorical question. I actually don't want to answer that one. What is it about? Is it about who we, what we get out of it? Do we come here because we get something? Do we come here because, you know, I've seen those things where, you know, you got so many hours, how many hours in a week and you come to worship one hour and you get your batteries recharged. Is that why we come here? I got, I only got one head shaking out here, but like I said, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I got a story for you. Mark Allen Powell is the New Testament professor at Trinity Seminary in Columbus, Ohio. It's a, one of the seminaries of the ELCA. He's a, he's a very interesting man. He's written lots of very interesting books. One of those books is called Loving Jesus. And in a chapter that is called Sunday Morning, he has a story. It says, I remember talking to a Christian rock fan down in Austin, Texas. He was a Jesus freak, just like I used to be and still wanted to be. And I envied him. He was just living in the joy of the Lord, reading his Bible every day and praying to Jesus and speaking in tongues and playing Christian rock on a stereo. When I asked him about church, he didn't write it off, but he did say that he hadn't been able to find a congregation where he felt like he fit in. The church where I'm a member, he said, is something like out of old black and white TV show, you know, like Ozzy and Harriet or Leave it to Beaver. Everybody dresses up in suits and they play this music that doesn't sound like anything on the radio. And the preacher talks about things that have nothing to do with my life. And I don't know. It's just it's just so boring. So he said he didn't go. And I asked him about finding a different church, but he didn't know about denominations and didn't really want him to get all the different doctrines and stuff. And so he just didn't go anywhere. Maybe when I'm older, I'll get more out of it, he said. Or maybe the church will, you know, lighten up or something. Well, this time I did give advice. I don't know if it was good advice or not, but I thought about it over overnight and then got back to him and said, do you love Jesus? I asked him. Yes, I do. I love him with all my heart. Would you die for him? Yes, I would. So you would die for him, but you won't be bored for him. 
And so I said, this is what I think the Lord wants you to do. I think that Jesus wants you to get out of bed every Sunday morning and go to that Ozzie and Harriet church and just sit there for one hour being bored. Do it for him. Call it bearing your cross if you like, but just do it. And part of the reason Powell said this was because as a young pastor, he said he'd visited a number of inactive members of his churches that he was serving. He sums up those visits. Everyone was saying in some way, shape or form, I quit coming to church because I wasn't getting out of it what I thought I should get out of it. Where did we get the idea that what happens on Sunday mornings is for us? This is God's day and we come here to worship. And who do we come to worship? God. Not us. Not the person sitting next to us. You come here to worship God. So why does it matter if we get anything out of it? Because who is it really about? What is all of this really about? Matthew, today's lesson, Jesus talks to the disciples and he says to the disciples that a, that a slave is not greater than, that a master is not greater than a slave and a learner is not greater than their teacher, right? We're all evil. We're all. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, but it works. We are all evil. We all do have those tendencies inside of us. We're all level, right? Jesus puts us on the same level as him. He makes us brothers and sisters. He, he sets us against others who are not part of his family. Right? Jesus said in here, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. I guarantee you that a lot of other pastors out there are probably preaching on Romans this morning. Because it's a lot easier to talk about. This is one of those passages when you get to it in the lectionary as a pastor, you go... Really? I got to do what with this? I have to stand up in front of people and, and make them feel good about their lives in Christ. And you're telling them that you didn't come to bring peace, but you came to bring a sword. And that you're going to set a son against his father and a daughter against his mother. And you're going to make families become enemies. And that's good news. Right? Because the gospel is literally good news. So how does this work? What does it mean that Jesus did not come to bring peace, but a sword? Well, the word there really isn't sword. It's more of a feminine version of the word for knife. So you could picture a little small pocket knife if that makes you feel any better about it. But it's not really the fact that it's a sword. I think Luke captured the essence of what Jesus is trying to say here much better when in Luke's version of this story he said Jesus says I did not come to bring peace but division right what does Jesus mean by son will be against father and daughter will be against mother does it literally mean that they're going to fight each other and pick up swords and go to battle is that what that means no it doesn't mean that it means that if you follow Jesus, you're probably going to do something that your parents aren't going to like. Right? And think about it in the day that Jesus said this to his disciples. What, were, what was the predominant religion in Jesus' society? Judaism. Right? So if you became a follower of Jesus in a Jewish family, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to be disowned. You're going to be set out of the house. You're going to be set against your father and mother or your son and your daughter if you're the parents that are following Jesus, right? This is a clear picture of what's happening in that society. I mean, think about it for a moment, parents. What could your kids do that you would, you would just lock them out of your house? Can any of you think of anything that your kids would do that you would lock them out of your house? I actually have one going. I listen to a, a podcast every week called, um, on a site called Working Preacher. It's done by three seminary professors from Luther Seminary, and they talked about this. And they were all, all of them said, there's no way that, I would, that my kids would ever do anything that would make me want to lock them out of the house. And then one of them shared a story about how when he was a professor at a college that had a 12-step program built into the college of one of the kids in that program. 
and the parent that locked this kid out of the house. And you think it's never going to happen, right? This is this. I hope to God it never happens in any of your households or any of your lives. But I remember the day when I was probably the age of my middle daughter. Actually, I was younger. I was much younger than she was. The pounding on the door from my sister who wanted to get back in the house because my father had changed the locks. Because she was an alcoholic. Or she is an alcoholic. And she was addicted to other drugs at that point in time. And my father had had enough of her stealing from all of us, of her doing things behind our backs and not listening to what he had told her to do. Then in the middle of the day, one day when she was gone, he changed the locks. And it was late at night, and I was already asleep. But the pounding on that door and the wailing from outside. My mother got up and let her in. The next day she was gone. Now, don't ever think that there's not a time that your children will do something that you won't set them out of your house. But again, I say, I pray that none of you ever go through that. But that's what Jesus is talking about. Because there's going to come a time when things could get in the way. And it's not a bad thing here. It's a good thing that the families are set against each other. He says this is going to happen. And it happened in his day. And he goes on to say, you must become worthy of me, right? He talks about the cost of being a disciple after that. He talks about what we have to do to be a disciple, right? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword to set family members against family members. And then he lists out three things that you have to do to be a disciple. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Right? What does that mean? What is the most important thing in your life? It can't be. I just had a parent point to their child. And it can't be. I'm sorry. You're not the most important thing in life. You're a very high second or third. Right? What about spouse? Is your spouse the most important thing in your life? It can't be. Your spouse cannot be the most important thing in your life. Again, it can be another close second or third. Jesus says to the disciples that if you love anything more than you love me, then you're not worthy of me. You hear people talk about all the time giving things up to follow Jesus. I gave up drugs and I gave up alcohol and I gave up eating slugs and worms and I gave up all of these things. But that doesn't matter. What did you give up that's most important to you? Right. Paul's testimony in Philippians chapter three, he gave up everything that was important to him, his all of his religion, all of his heritage, all of everything that he was and threw it aside to follow after Christ. That's what Jesus wants us to do. It's not about giving up something that's easy. It's about putting the things that we think are most important second and putting him first. And then he says, you have to do what? Hate mother, father, hate all these other people. And then what do you have to do? Take up your... Say louder. Cross. cross. You know this is the first time that the cross is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew? This is chapter 10 of the Gospel of Matthew. And this is the first time the word cross is ever mentioned in the Gospel. And it's not in reference to Jesus going to the cross. It's in reference to Jesus saying that His disciples had to take up their cross has nothing to do with Jesus's cross. It has everything to do with the disciples taking up a cross. And what does that mean? We have to understand that we have to understand what the cross means, right? The cross was not for Roman citizens. It was for socio-political marginalized people that were known as rebellions or foreigners. The cross was a means of dividing citizens from non-citizens and the socially acceptable from those who had been rejected. Jesus is telling the disciples that you have to put yourself in the place of the marginalized, 
You have to put yourself in the place of those who are set out and cast out by society. You have to hate everybody that loves you and everything that you hold dear and everything that you think is better in life. And love me more than that. And not only that, now you have to put yourself in the place of, of the people that society doesn't want to see. Remember, I said we're going to get to the, where this is good news. So, hold on. <laughs> right? He says you have to be worthy of me. He says anyone who is worthy of me will take up their cross. And what does it mean to be worthy? The word used worthy is used several times throughout this. But the, the verse that most correlates with what we're talking about this morning in Matthew is Matthew 22 verse 8. Where the text reads, then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Remember the king threw a wedding banquet. And he told his servants to go out and invite all of the people that should be here, all the rich people, and bring them in. And all of them had reasons why they couldn't come, right? I just bought a new set of ox. I just got, you know, I had a new kid. I had, you know, all of these things. And they weren't worthy. Are you ready to put Jesus first? And to put yourself in the place of the marginalized? Because when Jesus tells us to pick up our cross... He calls us to choose a way of life of marginalization to identify with the nobodies and the slaves and those who society wants to push away. Because it's all about saving your life, right? Those are the three things. Hate, mother, father, take up your cross, and anyone who loses their life for my sake will gain it, right? It's about losing your life, and how do we do that? It's about confessing everything that we've done and laying everything at the feet of Jesus. And how do we do that? We come to confession and we say, I can do better, right? I've talked about this before. I can do better, Jesus. I promise next time I'll do better. Is that what confession is about? Saying I can do better? Remember, this means yes. This means no. Thank you, Bill, for the right answer there. The answer is... No, confession is not about telling Jesus that I can do better. Confession is about coming to Jesus and saying, I can't do this by myself. I can't do this. It's one of those phrases that when my kids say that, I just kind of cringe. Right? Because as a parent, you want to say, yes, you can. You just haven't tried hard enough yet. Right? But that's not the point here point here is that Jesus is the first thing that are in our lives and he's helping us to identify with the people that need the, the identification, the people that need to be lifted up. And then he wants us to come to him and say that, you know what, Jesus, I can't do this by myself and I need you to help me do it. I need you to walk beside me. I need you to walk with me. I need you to help me carry that cross because I can't do it by myself. And the good news here is the message from Romans. That when we were baptized into that death, that death that Jesus went to on the cross, and when, then when we were lifted up out of that water, we were raised again like Jesus was raised from the dead. And Jesus promised us in that resurrection that he was always going to walk with us and he was never going to forsake us and that he would give us the strength through himself and through the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us into the world. And that's what the good news is. That when we connect with Jesus and we put him first in our lives and we identify with those who he wants us to identify with. And we give up everything and come to him and tell him that I can't do it and I need your help. Then he lifts us up and sends us out into the world prepared to do what he's called us to do. So are you ready? You don't seem very enthused. Here's the other to switch to this is we really don't have a choice. Jesus is sending us whether we want to go or not. It's kind of like the kids that go off to college. You push them out the door, right? They might act like they're ready to go, but they don't want to leave yet. <laughs> Someone who's been there and done that, right? I want to be on my own, but I want mom and dad to be there for me. And that's what Jesus is. God, your father, knows the hairs on your head and cares for you more than anyone ever possibly could and won't leave you alone to suffer and die, but will walk with you and give you strength in everything that you face. So go. Put him first. Identify with those who he's asking you to identify with and tell him you can't do it on your own.
but you want him to help you because he always will. And now remember, we're singing all five verses.